my name is Joe Foy. I'm National Campaign Director for the Wilderness Committee. And this year, 2015, is our 35th anniversary of protecting Canadian wilderness and nature. Well, we've learned a few things over the past 35 years. One of the things that we've learned is that change, positive change, doesn't just happen. You've got to work at it. And certainly over the past 35 years, dozens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people have been associated with the Wilderness Committee as we've won our various campaigns. And that's why we produced this video. Of course, the other thing we've learned is that 35 years goes by faster than you'd think. And of course, not all our campaigns are won, far from it. And some of our campaigns we've been working for the entire 35 years and haven't won yet. So this video is to remember what we're fighting for, a Canada whose wild nature is protected. Uh, to have some fun while we're doing it and to look forward to the next 35 years of winning our campaigns. Conservationists are headed for a showdown over the Stein River Valley. It is a large wilderness area between Worcester and the Fraser Canyon. The actual battle over its future is probably still two years away, but both sides are already gearing up for it. The logging community has bumper stickers declaring share the Stein. On the other side, the lapel buttons say, the Stein, roadless forever. We believe the valley, uh, the valley has great, far greater value as wilderness, and uh, it should remain that way. Wilderness for whom? It's reasonably inaccessible. When Banff was set aside, a lot of people said, the, no one will go there, it's unfortunate we're, we're creating this park. That was an argument for people at that time, some people. But the ones with vision and the ones with foresight actually saw how valuable that place was. A husband and wife team are finished here packing for the plane now. Between them, they've done 10 pieces in three days. I'm a peak freak. I, I do a lot of uh, combinations, peaks, paintings. <laughs> From the works done here, several artists have offered to donate more than one original. When they're all auctioned in late October, bids are expected to begin at $750. An auction total of 25,000 is reachable. Funds for the Wilderness Committee. Joe Foy, one of the directors of the Western Canada Wilderness Committee, explains what the organization is all about and what the aims of the group are. Well, the Western Canada Wilderness Committee is a non-profit uh, society uh, whose main objective is the preservation of wilderness uh, through education. And uh, we do that through uh, all sorts of things, trail building, uh, posters, newspapers, and events like tonight. Okay, and this event is for the preservation of the Stein Valley. Well, we've done many different kinds of events, but you're right, this is the first time when this particular alliance has happened, that is artists and people concerned about the Stein Valley. And it's been so successful, and the artists have been uh, so interested and, and just really enjoyed what they did uh, in the Stein that we're thinking about a place called Carmana Valley next year. Those are the tallest trees in the nation. It's a temperate rainforest in the west coast of Vancouver Island, and I can hardly wait to see what, what comes out of Carmana Valley. When we discovered that MMB was building roads at breakneck speed, we moved right in. We sensed that their strategy was to log the area as quickly and quietly as possible. We started building trails to get people to the bottom of the valley. We knew that if people saw the forest there, that they would know that the area must be saved. surviving areas of old growth is the Carmana Valley, a tiny watershed on the southwest coast of Vancouver Island. When Macmillan Bloedel Limited revealed plans to clear-cut the entire area, public opposition was widespread and dramatic. Throughout the summer of 1989, more than 100 of Canada's most gifted artists trekked into the rainforest to stage an innovative protest. 
Organized by the Western Canada Wilderness Committee, the Carmana Art Project brought together visual artists from a wide variety of backgrounds to raise public awareness about the threat to the rainforest. By the end of the summer, four separate expeditions of artists into the Carmana had produced over 100 original works of art. In Vancouver, the collection received critical acclaim during a popular exhibition. All the art was donated to the Wilderness Committee to help raise funds for saving the Carmana. The work of 70 artists was selected for a distinctive book called Carmana, Artistic Visions of an Ancient Rainforest. The book went on to garner several awards and become a bestseller. My friends and I are here to camp for a couple of days to visit a, an experimental station. And we're going to bring you to one of the most magnificent forests in the world, the Carmana Valley Rainforest in British Columbia. That's just going to yank me. Yeah, that's our main one. And we have first of our backup systems. Pop on, please. Here we go, folks. All stories up. See ya. Where are we, Joe? We are 120 feet up a 245 Sitka spruce tree in the middle of an old growth forest on the west coast of Vancouver Island. So there's still another, how many feet to go up there? There's over 100 feet above us, and we're a long ways up. We're 12 stories up. Now, have there been any uh, platforms and study areas like this anywhere in the temperate rainforest? None in the temperate rainforest. We understand there have been some in the tropical rainforest, but this is the first canopy research platforms in the temperate rainforest. In the world? In the world, and we think they're the, they're the tallest, they're the highest up of even the tropics. Well, those guys are going to be up there for quite a long time, so why don't we go off and do some exploring by ourselves? Okay. Many of the, the plants and animals and birds and mushrooms we find in this forest can't be found in the forest that most people know. Well, a lot of people think that when a, an old tree falls in the forest that it's no longer any good for anything. But in fact, uh, what it can do is it can become the home for new young trees to grow. As it rots down, it's literally being recycled. It's being used to grow new young trees. And so that's why it's called a, a nurse log. And it's also the home for lots of other small plants and animals that are living in the dead wood. Whenever a controversy crops up in BC's logging industry, the members of the Western Canada Wilderness Committee will soon be on the scene. But who are these people? And exactly how do they protest? Fanny Kiefer reports. How many people would they arrest? before McMillan vote down, we'll reckon with public concern. This is atrocity. Environmental protesters are under fire. Some are blockading roads, spiking trees, and breaking the law. Forestry giant Mac Blow suggests the 25,000-member Western Canada Wilderness Committee may be organizing some of this action. The latest hotspot is the Sitka Valley on the east coast of Vancouver Island. WC Squared has launched a libel suit against MacBlow's accusations, while the company is in court trying to keep all protesters away from their logging site. We have a philosophy, and I think that that's what a party is elected on, their philosophy and, uh, and the people that, are, that make it up. Isn't that in the summer of 1980, Paul George and a group of friends started up the Western Canada Wilderness Committee. In 83, Paul and his wife, Adrian Carr, turned to green politics, but quickly left the political fray and resumed their battle for wilderness preservation. Paul George of WC Squared. Who is on the blockade? Who is hanging out of the trees over there? Well, we had one director who was arrested, and he's stepped down as a director. Now, uh, he maintains he's innocent, and I guess there's even some video footage of it. Well, we believe he's innocent, but until the courts actually uh, rule on uh, that he's not on the board. What would I have to do to get kicked out of WC Squared? 
Uh, we've never kicked anybody out yet, if I, if I remember correctly. But if someone did in our name, like someone used the name and did something illegal, we would kick them out. And uh, the hard thing is that the people get passionate, and, and if they're not good at writing letters, they really want to do something, and they think there's a quick, quick way to do it. And so our organization feels that the, the only way is the, is the slow, plodding method of educating people. Wilderness Committee, can I help you? Yes. The committee produces everything from educational calendars to lavish coffee table books, all to get their Save the Wilderness message across to the public, the forest industry, and the media. If they're going to say, we're not willing to give up jobs, you're not willing to give up the earth, then, then where's the common ground through the middle? Because there's lots of ways to keep jobs, there lots is, and lots. And the, the statement, there's been no movement, I, I think that's what we've been seeing in the last while, a heck of a lot of movement. Our society's in flux right now. You sat here and told us at the beginning that you feel that you hold a public trust. Yes. And when we say to you, you're disenfranchising the middle ground, you're not representing the middle ground of the public, what's your answer? I believe Wait. that uh, one of the uh, increases in our membership and one of the great increases of the people that I see uh, coming to work with a committee are the middle ground. The fact that you see us in court isn't because we have a bunch of money, it's because uh, we have a, a number of uh, lawyers who believe in our issues. That to be seen as being a member of a committee that has made compromise, even establish something as, as maybe insignificant to you as reducing a cut block from 35 hectares down to 20 hectares. That politically you're not willing to be seen as being a party to that kind of a, a solution, which is getting on the road to improving logging conditions. What we're saying is it's not, it's not a solution when every last old growth watershed is gone. Oh, that is not benefits. a solution. Okay. Mac Blow suggests you are seasoned veterans of media manipulation. Uh, such campaigns as are now going on in the Sitica. Well, you look at their stuff, they spend a lot more money at it. They're the Goliaths, we're still the Davids. They are working very hard to start punching a road through the last wilderness area right to the boundaries of Pacific Rim National Park. Today, Pacific Rim National Park is a large strip, only a kilometer or two wide along the ocean in this park. It's not, it's not viable as an ecosystem without the wilderness area of the Walburn adjoining it. Is Fletcher Challenge willing to give us time? No. They're using their grapple yarders and their bulldozers like tanks and armored personnel carriers. So a four-ton, 380-year-old red cedar stump they call Littlefoot. The Western Canada Wilderness Committee says the stump comes from a clear cut in the Clockwood. They're taking it on the road to raise awareness of the issue and also to gather signatures on a petition to put pressure on the federal government to turn the area into a park. The federal government has an absolute responsibility to deal with jobs and the environment, as they did in South Moresby, when the federal government stepped in and negotiated with the Haida Nation and the provincial government uh, to create uh, uh, Haida Gwaii, South Moresby uh, 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 Park. The stump will spend four more days in Vancouver before making the journey to Ottawa. The caravan is expected to arrive on October 22nd.
picked up a rock about that big, weighing 10, 15 pounds, held it over my head, said he was gonna smash my head in. And at that point, one of the loggers fired up his chainsaws and began to cut down the tree I was in. Interfor and environmentalists have been battling over the construction of a logging road in the ancient rainforest today. Serious allegations against some Interfor employees tonight. Keep it civil. Hey, come on, man. Keep it civil. We're, well, come on. Unlawful arrest! Unlawful arrest! Can we demand that the Jane government of British Columbia step in an and do their duty the and Mr. make this Justice a national park? It's Friday the 17th we won't day of rest. September 9th. These are the oldest known living Douglas fir trees in all of Canada. Some of these trees are over 1,300 years old. It means they were, uh, they were born, as it were, about the time of Muhammad. Very, uh, they're older than the, the, than the oldest cathedrals in, in Europe, and they're only a uh, several hour drive from Vancouver. It's amazing that they've survived uh, to be still with us today at the end of the 20th century. The spotted owl. As far as endangered species go, this is top of the list in Canada. Only found in southeast BC and only a couple of dozen left. This is the Siwash Creek area east of the Fraser Canyon. It's 487 hectares of prime owl habitat and prime timber. Six weeks ago, environmentalists used a temporary court injunction to cut down attempts to log the area. There's no way that they're going to allow logging in the owl habitat now. But they have. The BC Forest Service now says Cattermole Timber can selectively log an 88 hectare section. Although the decision leaves 80% of this forest protected for now, that's not enough, according to environmentalists. This is a logging plan. They want to kill off this species to be able to sell a few more truckloads of lumber. And that's obscene. It's wrong. It's been going down five times faster than anticipated. And for them to go, give the go-ahead to log in an area of critical habitat is crazy. I mean, this owl's not going to be around in 10 years at the rate we're going. To help hold back that tide, environmentalists will once again go to court and fight the decision. Yeah, so this spot right here, we're right in um, really the mouth, you know, the bottom end of, uh, of Lost Creek Valley fairly near to the Indian Reservation, only a few kilometers away. And um, what we find, though, as we go further up the valley is that there is a historic trail, and we find evidence of this kind of activity quite a ways on up the valley. And uh, when uh, we look, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, when we look at the logging plans for this valley and where the planned cut blocks are laid, they're laid over areas with a great history of First Nations activity. Cedar trees, big cedars, big dug firs, that's what the logging industry is going after. Well, I'd like to see this area kept just the way it is, eh? Because there's, there's just too much logging as it is. And you know, some, some places should be left as is. Beautiful British Columbia. It's the slogan used to sell tourism in our province majestic mountains and pristine parks. But now the provincial government is planning to open the gates to private lodges in public parks. We're flabbergasted that they've just gone ahead and done this behind closed doors. Gwen Barley is concerned development in 10 parks around British Columbia could have ecological repercussions. She says this is just another cash grab for the Liberal government. I think what they're trying to do is increase visits to parks, but what's happened since 2001 with cutbacks to park staffs, with parking meters being put into parks, with rolling back park boundaries allowing logging in parks, we've actually seen visits drop by 25%. And this government doesn't give a damn about the environment, and you can see that and clearly in their approach towards parks. Parks should be for everybody. They shouldn't be, be just for people who can afford to go into them. Good evening, and we begin with what appears to be the kiss of death tonight for a private power project along the Upper Pitt River. A company called Run of River Power had applied to build seven power generating stations on tributaries of the Upper Pitt. And part of its proposal called for a transmission line to run through Pinecone Burke Provincial Park. But the project ran up against some serious public opposition. And today, the Environment Minister made a decision that could throw up the final roadblock.
It was celebrations all around for environmental groups today, as news emerged that a proposed power project that could have significant impact on a cherished river ecosystem in the Lower Mainland wasn't going to get B.C. government support. The Wilderness Committee is thrilled that Minister Penner made the decision to pull the plug on the private power project in the Upper Pit. But the Upper Pit River Power Project is not the only controversial run-of-the-river project being proposed for B.C. The government has put out the call for the generation of more electrical power from the private sector, and more than 100 other run-of-the-river projects are in the design stage. All over this province, from the Kootenays to out in Powell River, all on Vancouver Island, the, there are power projects, private power projects being proposed that are just as damaging and may not have the thousand people. But the environment minister says everyone should calm down. Barry Penner says his decision on the upper pit shows that just because a project is being proposed, it doesn't mean it's automatically going to get the green light to proceed. Environmentalists also packed into Oak Bay today, appealing for a stop to old growth logging on the island. Demonstrators set up outside MLA Ada Chong's constituency office. About 100 protesters braved the wind, carrying banners in an ongoing effort to affect the government's policies surrounding the logging of old growth trees in BC. Um, and virtually the entire world is logging second, third, and fourth growth forest now. BC is one of the few jurisdictions which says that it's okay to finish off the last of the unprotected old growth forests on a place like Vancouver Island or the Lower Mainland. How many places on earth have trees that are as wide as a, uh, uh, wide as a living room, as tall as a skyscraper, and can live to almost 2,000 years old? Those opposed to oil tanker traffic off the coast of B.C. held a high-profile protest today. Members of No Tanks, the Wilderness Committee and Greenpeace held a rally at Second Beach this afternoon calling for a ban on oil tankers off the B.C. coast. They boarded boats in a flotilla that traveled to Lionsgate Bridge where tankers have passed through since 2007. We're calling for a public process so that people can actually have their say. Uh, you know, this, this change to allow these super tankers happened without any public involvement, without any, you know, public process of any kind. So we're, we're very concerned about that. Uh, and ultimately, we think there should be a ban on oil tankers off the coast of British Columbia. Last week, environmental activists smeared molasses on themselves before wading into English Bay. The demonstrators say this year's BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico highlights the real threat posed by increasing tanker traffic in the port of Vancouver and a proposal by Enbridge to build a second pipeline between Edmonton and Kitimat. The B.C. and federal governments are now looking at the possibility of creating a new national park in this province. The idea would be to protect the desert, grasslands and ponderosa pine ecosystems of the South Okanagan and Similkameen Valleys. The Wilderness Committee recently commissioned a poll. And what we are really thrilled to find out is that the poll showed that 63 percent of people living in the South Okanagan Similkameen supported a national park. Does this logging road in northern Manitoba look like logging to you? If it is logging, it may be illegal. That's the argument environmentalists are taking to court. In a legal first to protect sensitive woodland caribou habitat. So putting this road through one of the most sensitive areas of Grass River Provincial Park will have a tremendous impact on woodland caribou. Eric Radar is with the Wilderness Committee. He and his lawyers are using a rarely used legal tool to ask a judge to clarify if the right given to Tolco to build the road was legal. Peace Valley is one of the last remaining pristine areas and uh, they're going to flood it. And it's not just going to affect our way of life, our, our cultural sites, our potential grave sites. Logan has taken her flight to the United Nations. Now she travels the country to explain why a third hydroelectric dam called Site C in Peace River would damage an already endangered ecosystem. C Wilderness Community believes the subsidized industrial companies is the real reason for Site C. It's not about keeping our lights on here, it's about providing subsidized electricity to mines in the northwest of the province and oil and gas in the northeast and feeding the tar sands in particular. And that's wrong. Just about every weekday, Ben West and staff gather in a boardroom that overlooks Burrard Inlet. About eight months ago, he started to notice more oil tankers plying the water up towards the Kinder Morgan loading dock. He started logging every vessel that passed by his window and quickly came to the conclusion that Burnaby was rapidly becoming a significant crude oil export terminal. 
from the time there has been a big increase, and now, of course, we're facing a potential even bigger increase. Uh, Kinder Morgan's talked about expanding their pipeline from about 300,000 barrels a day, what we're at now, to up to about 700,000 barrels a day. And we could see almost 300 uh, oil tankers moving through the inlet uh, on an annual basis. Already there's a website called Marine Traffic where you can see every major shipping vessel in the world, where it's now, where it's been, and where it's going. The red icons indicate oil tankers, and there are two of them currently moored in Burrard Inlet. The Wilderness Committee is now planning to relay this information to anyone who wants to know. So we send three different messages, one uh, on Twitter, uh, one when it goes past the second arrows, which is the narrowest part of the inlet, uh, one when it's fueling up at the Kinder Morgan Terminal, and one when it's leaving. Wood is a farmer going out to check his underwater crop. He makes a good living from these Pacific oysters. To some of the high-end markets, this will sell for um, three fifty each. But Greg Wood believes his oysters, his industry, and his way of life are threatened by a proposed coal mine for the nearby hillside. Don Snyder is one of the residents leading the opposition. So I think there's frustration, there's, there's probably anger, and then I think there's fear that what's, what's of the unknown. Will it affect our water quality? Will it affect the shellfish growers in Bain Sound? Will it or will it not? If the mine is built on his doorstep, Snyder worries what will happen to his water supply. No way! Environmentalists and the local First Nation all oppose the mine too calling it contrary to the province's green agenda. Coal as a, a fossil fuel is one of the dirtiest fossil fuels. And here in BC, we are in the midst of a massive expansion of our coal mining industry at the very time we're claiming to be climate leaders. The carcass of an 800-year-old red cedar lies in a parking lot in Carmana Walbrand Provincial Park on Vancouver Island. Poachers have stolen the rest of the valuable old growth. It's got to the point now where for a thousand parks and protected areas in British Columbia, there's 10 full-time park rangers, a few more seasonal in the summertime, but especially during the winter months, the odds of anyone being out there and, and catching them is, is so slim. And that's just, that should be the main function of, of parks is protecting these areas, not, not leaving them wide open for this kind of thing to happen. Well, I'm Owen and I'm the climate campaigner at the Wilderness Committee. And as you can tell from my accent, I didn't grow up here and I've traveled a long way from where I came from to talk about climate change. But I chose British Columbia to talk about climate change for one very important reason. This is the most important place in the world for people to know about and to care about and to stop climate change. And why is that? Why is it here and not anywhere else in the world? Well, our local tar sands exporter, Kinder Morgan, wants to send 150 million metric tons of carbon into the atmosphere through its local pipeline here and onto large oil tankers. We have a coal expansion by our port and it aims to make this the biggest coal exporter in North America. And that's another 100 million tons of carbon. And just when you thought things couldn't get any better, the British Columbia government turns around and says, that our economic future hangs on putting out 200 million tonnes of carbon in the form of liquefied natural gas. So I'm standing here today on the shore of Fish Lake on the Chilcotin Plateau. In the Chilcotin language, this place is Teltan B. Tosico Mines wishes to put a huge open pit mine right here at the outflow of Teltan B. And Above us here, uh, just upstream from the lake, a couple of kilometers up from the lake, they want to put, uh, build a massive uh, tailings pond held back by a dam that is as tall as the uh, Hotel Vancouver when, it's, when it would be completed. Many people don't want to uh, see this dam, tailings pond, open pit mine, and everything that would go along with it happen because of the great risk it would put this lake at, and everything that this lake flows down into, which includes 
the Tosico River and the Chilcotin River. It has rejected a controversial mining project in the central interior for a second time. Ottawa has once again said no to the new prosperity mine. The environment minister says Tosico's plan would cause damage that couldn't be mitigated. Tosico wanted to build the gold and copper mine at Fish Lake, which is not too far from Williams Lake. A special panel found the mine would contaminate the lake and destroy another smaller lake used as a tailings pond. Uh, huge risk to water quality, huge risk to fisheries, huge risk uh, to wildlife. There are better mine projects than this. This is perhaps the worst mine project that we've seen, and it's great that it's been turned down. Vancouver-based Tosaco Mines will have its day in court early next week. The company is going to argue that the BC Wilderness Committee defamed them because the nonprofit organization spoke out against its new Prosperity Mine project. The Wilderness Committee say they're exercising a basic right. We have stood our ground, we'll go to court, and we'll be arguing that, like all Canadians, we have a right to comment on these, uh, these types of mining projects. First Nations have spoken out against the project from the beginning, stating it would devastate a lake and interfere with wildlife. The Wilderness Committee has already spent nearly $15,000 in preparation for court. They say they will continue to speak out against this project. Yet another war in the woods could be gearing up on Vancouver Island. Maps obtained by the Wilderness Committee show a logging company is prepping to cut a section of the Walburn Valley near Carmana Walburn Provincial Park. And joining me by Skype from Vancouver Island to tell us more about this is Torrance Cost of the Wilderness Committee. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me on. So describe this area to me. It's it's really one of the last of its kind. It's uh, one of the largest intact tracts of unlogged old growth forest that we have left on Vancouver Island, especially southern Vancouver Island. And the difference between it and some of our forests that have been logged and are growing back is, is hard to put into words. Uh, there's trees that are as big as your living room, and then there's trees that are as big as your finger, and everywhere in between. This is a healthy functioning system, and it's really not something that we have enough of to be squandering, uh, which is exactly what the logging company Teal Jones is, is looking to do. Really, what, right now, what do you do? Do you just wait and see what happens next? So we're mobilizing our membership. Uh, we have, Wilderness Committee has uh, 60,000 members and supporters across Canada. Uh, and in situations uh, like this, this is where they step up, get really involved, um, and start to put pressure on the, on the provincial government. We make it really easy at our website, which is wildernesscommittee.org. Hi, I'm Glenn Barley, and I'm the policy director with Wilderness Committee. Right now, we have an amazing opportunity to create a national park in the South Okanagan Similkameen. Wilderness Committee has been working on this campaign and I've been working on this campaign for over 12 years. Test this thing out. Hi, my name is Joe Foy. I'm from the Wilderness Committee. And so today I want to thank each and every one of you. And when you go home today, I want you to think how you stood on the very front line of history, a good history that we can look forward to and be proud of. Well, that's all I've got for you from the video vault for now. Remember, you can join the Wilderness Committee and help out on our various campaigns at wildernesscommittee.org. That's wildernesscommittee.org. Bye for now.